again, most welcome to this session, the theme for breakout session, where we provide you with an update from three of the projects, the projects that are actually in this theme. Again, this was shown this morning, but I would really want to show it again of pure joy and uh, thankfulness for all the companies involved in what I think is a unique and great collaboration uh, software center. So some companies have been here from the start as well as some of the universities. And then over these 10 years, we have had companies and universities join. And that is, I think, a true privilege for, for us and for all of us involved to have you to have you with us. And we hope for many more good years. The agenda for this session is the following. So I will present what is referred to as Project 5, uh, Accelerating Digitalization Through Data. Then we have another Project 9, which is also me presenting more on the ecosystem dimension. Uh, then we have uh, Eric Knaus, who will join us and present RE for uh, so requirements engineering for large scale agile systems development. And then we have reserved a slot in the very end for questions, discussion, basically some time for everyone in the call to, uh, to share opinions and expertise. I do see that we have people in the lobby and my question to you is if you can also see them in the lobby and if people could help me admit them. Yes, no problem. Thank you so much, Martin. Thanks a lot. Then I can just continue and run the slide. So if I start then with uh, the project number five, accelerating digitalization through data. This is collaborative work between me and Jan Bosch. And this project has been running for a number of years by now. We started out with the very basics of going data driven. We worked on A-B testing practices. More recently, we started working more on the value modeling. And during the most recent two sprints, our focus has also uh, broadened to include more on the business agility. So if you work with value modeling, if you really try to nail down what the customer values you tend to, you want to prioritize are, how can you also design your business in a way that you very nimbly and flexibly can, can move towards continuously delivery of that value as well as improvement of the customer value that you develop. So that's the basic. So the data driven, the value modeling and the business agility, those are the three main topics that we address and they merge very well together in this in this project. A little bit of the background and I will start with a quote. So typically, I mean, the one thing I know about strategy, it's the assumptions that kill you, not your competitors. And the reason I bring this up is that very often we think we have a very good understanding of what the customers want. But when we really start looking into a measure, it is not always so that we are as, as spot on as what we would have hoped for. So the whole notion of data driven development is to move from more of an assumption based, opinions based way of working and approaching customer value towards something where you basically use data from products in the field to monitor, to measure and to continuously evaluate how your product is used, what features are used or not used and how your customers are actually using, appreciating and perceiving your products. So we worked also with a large number of online companies where the experimentation, the A-B testing and those types of practices are, you could say, default practices. But during the last years, we see this really taking off in the embedded systems domain as well. So with connected products, with data coming back from the field, also the embedded systems companies, so the software center companies are increasingly running more of the data driven practices in their on their sites. So experiments, you could say. But of course, here the 
factors you address are different. So the KPIs can be, for example, these ones. So you look to increase performance, you look to increase stability, security, efficiency, etc. And the most important thing, as we have learned, and the most challenging thing is to know what is it really that we seek to achieve. So what of all the value factors that are important is the most important one? And how do we really reason about what we optimize for? So this is where value modeling come into play. And we have spent a number of years working with value modeling and how to implement this practice in the software center companies. As a very basic, I mean, value modeling is all about aligning different metrics. Metrics that exist at different levels in an organization, the team, the feature level have a certain set of metrics. The product, the system level has a different set of metrics. Much, you, and you, then can, you can define your agenda this afternoon, don't worry. Yeah, I will, uh, so Krista will. Oh, we have a background discussion, but no worries. And then no at the top, you <laughs> have the business level value factors. And so, Value modeling is intended to help companies align these to make sure that you avoid sub-optimization or even you, you, you want to avoid having teams or units even contradicting each other. So it is all about alignment. It is all about making sure that every team at a feature level align to the overall business goals. We have been working with a number of the software center companies and we these are just two examples where you try to build a hierarchical model where you then also not only make sure that different metrics align, but also you put a relative weight on these. So you, you, you really encourage people in the organization to decide what is more important than something else. Typically, we are in a, in a discussion very often that where people say everything everything matters, everything is important, which is typically also true. But in order to really specify what it is exactly that you are optimizing for, you at some point need to prioritize something more than something else. And that's the discussion we have when creating a hierarchical value model. This is another example. So if we look at the last sprint, we worked quite, or we saw a few different patterns. We saw that value modeling had several different dimensions that companies uh, were using it for and where value modeling became a rewarding practice. So the scope dimension is one of the dimensions. So it's important to notice, or we, rather we noticed that you can work with value modeling on a pure feature level, where you basically care about the performance of a specific feature and you typically work very closely with one team. Then there is a system or a subsystem scope of value modeling where you then broaden the scope a little bit. And in the slide here, you see a few examples of the typical metrics. Th these are just examples, but these are a few of the metrics that we see companies use on these different levels or within these different scopes, you could say. And then there is the portfolio, the company, the customer, and even an ecosystem scope of value modeling. An interesting thing to note, uh, in our recent work, we see that many companies are now starting to look more into the customer scope. So what you want is then to learn, what is it that my customer regard as the most important KPIs for, for his business. And then you want to make sure that you as a company make help the customer fulfill the customer KPIs. So that's quite an interesting. And, and one of the examples here is from the truck business, where, for example, the truck companies in Software Center look into how can we, as a truck developer, uh, providing company make sure to fulfill on-time delivery for our customers. So that's just one example. Then we see the purpose of value modeling taking many different shapes. So for example, and as a start, companies typically use value modeling more for exploratory purposes. You have data available, 
you want to basically experiment with the data you have to create an understanding of something that already happened. So you could explore uh, the potential benefits of something by basically using the data you have to try to create, uh, well, explore the data space and explore what happened. When you have done a bit of exploration, typically companies start to develop a descriptive model you use your historical data. This is where you try to explain something that happened, uh, maybe understand the impact of uh, a new feature or impact of, say, a technology upgrade or a shift of device or something. But you basically try to explain a decision or an action that already happened. So that's the descriptive. Where many companies would want to move is to use the value modeling to become more of a prescriptive practice. You can still use your historical data, but you want to start to use it to understand what will happen. So based on my descriptive understanding, what could I expect to see in a few months or maybe even uh, more longer out in the future? And then in the very end, so here also you can quantify the something. What will the effect be in quantitative terms? And then at the very end, we see, or we don't really see, but we hear a wish to use value modeling also more as a practice for, or as a basis for reinforcement learning, where you don't actually take the decision yourself, but you have a clear understanding of what you optimize for, and then you can have machine learning technologies help you make an automated decision. And at the, at the bottom of the slide here, you basically see, and in the arrows, the move we see companies make going from exploratory, creating a descriptive understanding of something towards a prescriptive. And that's, I would say, that's where we are right now. And then the intent is, of course, to go even more automated and use the value modeling to also instrument your or advance your use of uh, machine learning technologies in the organization. The focus is as well different depending on where you uh, put your efforts. You could use value modeling basically for a product. This is where you look to identify the product KPIs and you really look to improve and optimize a certain product. And these are examples of questions that you might then ask yourself and where value modeling can help you improve. Things we experienced are companies that would want to use value modeling to basically understand the effects of adding a new feature. What will it make? What will it do to the system? And also, how does a product deteriorate over time? So those are typical questions in relation to the product focus of value modeling. We see as well a process focus. It's very similar to the product, but just in the context of a process. So you look for the process KPIs and you would want to use value modeling to really understand how your process improvements help decrease, for example, time to market, ensure product quality, etc. So those are also important metrics that we have been working with. I already mentioned that value modeling is an important technique to understand and deliver on your customer KPIs. And then the very end, uh, the very final focus here is the ecosystem uh, uh, focus of value modeling, where you basically try to assess, evaluate and monitor the partners that you are working with within your ecosystem. So that's uh, a fourth focus. We also saw, and I won't spend too much time on this one, but there is a time and granularity dimension of value modeling as well, where you can use aggregated and instance data in different ways to produce different insights or services. And there is also the time dimension of using historical, periodic data or real time data. All these different types of data can help you achieve different things if you, by using value modeling, really know what it is you look to achieve. So without saying too much on that, I think we have seen now that value modeling plays an important role for very many different purposes in the organizations that we work with. 
what is important also to note is especially the last bullet point on this slide. So with value modeling, we hope to help companies move from a very qualitative understanding of value towards a more quantitative. That is not to say that the qualitative techniques that we use will go away, but basically it is to say that we see a combination of these where we have some qualitative ways of working with regards to understanding customer value. You have the observations, you have the customer service, you have the customer interviews, you have the on-site visits, etc. But there is a need to become more quantitative, measuring, having metrics in place, instrumenting your product so that you can continuously also measure and monitor product performance and value delivery. So that's value modeling. The other thing I mentioned is that we now merge the value modeling topic with business agility for the pure reason or of if you produce value, which we do, which you do, you also want to constantly deliver and improve this value. And that's where business agility comes into play. We know agility from long before. We have seen the agile teams. We have seen the software organizations going all agile, which was mentioned in the opening talk this morning. This was maybe already 10 years ago where we started knowing the agile methods, the cross-functional teams as well. What we see a little less is agility at a system level. So there are a few examples where, for example, Tesla seek to replace not only and improve not only the software components in a system, but also, for example, electronics. And the ability to upgrade and continuously improve also the non-software parts of a system is, of course, critical for business agility, but something we don't see that much of yet. And the last and final step the entire business going agile requires, of course, much more than only product R&D. It needs to really involve the whole scope of a business, which we haven't really seen so far. We see all kinds of examples of scaling agile, but it seems to still be really difficult to go beyond DevOps. And that's why we have started talking about business agility 2.0 as something where we address not only the software parts of an organization or a system, but the entire scope, which means software, electronics, mechanics, but also the new digital technologies, data and AI. That's Business Agility 2.0. I won't go into the previous, like the traditional, what we used to know as Agile. That's the software uh, agility part that we already know and where the agile teams in the R&D organization work quite well. But what we want to see is to extend the software agility to the other parts of the organization. And to do this, we need to understand that the main, the most important thing is to think about um, customer value has to be delivered on a continuous basis. We are in a dynamic environment and we really need to think about business effectiveness rather than pure R&D efficiency. And that's where our concept come into play. And we talk about every role and every function at all levels need to be able to continuously evaluate, continuously monitor, learn and adjust and continuously improve and optimize. And to be able to do this, you need data driven practices you need more of the experimentation based practices and you need to be able to produce and also deliver value on a continuous basis, which means typically you complement your business model with a continuous, more service oriented business model. So with Business Agility 2.0, we say that you need four things. We need to then identify the optimal level of agility for each technology. These are different and we need to find the uh, optimal one for each of the technologies. You need to shorten all feedback loops at all levels. Even if they won't be the same, they can all be shortened. As I said, you typically need to 
complement your transactional business models with continuous business models. And you need to make sure that whatever slow cycle you have, that that cycle does not hinder the faster ones. So basically the business agility will then, we think of it as including all of the, there is the potential to include all of the technologies in a system in a more agility ways of working concept. But we need to find the ways to do what I just mentioned, identify the feedback loops, identify the levels of uh, improvement, et cetera, et cetera, for each of the technologies. And in our most recent work, we have spent quite some effort in talking our ways through and trying to understand how to move from software to systems agility. And this includes understanding how do we assess the length of different deployment cycles? How do we understand and determine the optimal release frequency? And how can we use data from the faster cycles to help us improve the slower ones? And in the last bullet point here, that is, I think, the most important thing that we worked on. How do we ensure that the value we generate, for example, with developing new features, is higher than the costs involved in development of this new functionality? And we reasoned our ways through this with a number of the software center companies and these are a few of the key factors that we identified as important for value capture. We have the customer value. That's how the customer perceived the, the functionality and what it is basically worth to a customer. Then as a company, as a development company, you need to be able to capture a percentage of this. Otherwise, you develop something that is valuable to a customer, but it doesn't pay off for your own organization. So there is a value capture percentage as well as one of the key factors. There is a development cost, the R&D, the cost of agile teams. So basically the development cost involved in, uh, in a product or a service. And then you have all kinds of manufacturing, distribution and maybe installation costs. These might, of course, vary depending on company and context, but there are a number of costs associated with development of new functionality. And then for some safety critical system functionalities, of course, there is a very uh, critical then certification cost. These are a few of the ones we found as key. And then based on this, we developed sort of a generic approach for value capture, you could say a formula. In the middle, you see the basic formula, which is then applicable for the electronics and mechanical parts of a system where you actually have the, the manufacturing, the development, the installation costs, etc., etc. The one you see in the blue is, for example, then if you talk about reinforcement learning, where you don't have these costs involved because there is no additional cost. These are purely digital yeah, products, you could say. And then to the right in the green, you see the formula instantiated for software where you do not have the similar costs as well, assuming that development is running, you don't start from scratch, you have a team, etc., etc. There are a number of assumptions involved in this formula. We did validation with uh, especially two of the software center companies, so there is additional input. But what we are trying to capture, and this is quite important, it, it's not so much about the exact numbers in the formula, but rather a discussion on how to think about the value you produce versus the costs involved in order to understand when and what is worthwhile. How often can you spend effort on releasing certain types of functionality and how do the improvements over time generate? What value does the improvement over time generate in relation to the costs involved in, in developing these improvements? We have a few publications. These are just selected ones. And I will say a few words before I stop the recording about the coming sprints. We plan to keep these two topics running, so the value modeling and the business agility. 
with regards to value modeling, we look to especially study the combination of qualitative and quantitative approaches for evaluating value to the pure reason of a pure quantitative approach is actually really difficult to adopt. That is our experience from, from working with this for a number of years. It's very difficult to build a hierarchical quantitative value network just like that. So we look to really understand the combination of qualitative and quantitative approaches. When it comes to business agility, recently we learned from several of the software center companies that what is really interesting is what functionality do we place in the cloud and what functionality do we place on the edge to make sure that we have the optimal distribution from an agility perspective in relation to the non-software parts as well as the software parts of a system. So that's one. And then another learning from recent work is that I mentioned that typically agile practices are optimized for the software parts of a system, not so much for the non-software. But it is also actually the case that it is not fully understood how to work with the new digital technology such as data and AI in an agile fashion. We know the data ops, we know the ML ops and the several ops, but to continuously work with digital technologies in a DevOps fashion, in an agile fashion, is not fully understood. So we look to include also that in our work. We have a few deliverables specified, which basically is frame. They are frameworks to help companies. They are best practices. We typically provide principles and guidelines. Some of you have seen some of the models we develop, and that's typically what we aim for. And these are then related both to the value modeling techniques as well as the agility, uh, business agility framework that we already started working with some of you uh, in. And again, this is me and Jan Bosch, collaborative work. Feel free to contact us on, on these. Uh, this is us. So you are feel free to reach out if there are any questions.